Hello and welcome everybody, I'm Proper Varian and today we're here with a Q&A video for Victoria 3. We had this Q&A going on, of course it lasted for two hours so there were plenty of answers, plenty of questions that went answered and unanswered, you can't answer all of them, right? We already did two videos, I hope that you understand why I am splitting this because otherwise you would be looking at one five hour long video and that feels like it's a bit much. Uh, in today's video, what we are going to be covering are basically game mechanics, gameplay questions and so on and so forth that didn't really fit any of the categories that I had for the previous videos. Uh, sometimes there may be some overlap, but usually it's something that is a bit out of left field, right? Uh, nonetheless, many of these were quite interesting, so let's just jump in and let's start with this one. Are there any plans for custom nations in any sort of way? Not necessarily EU4 like. Uh, we want to focus on the actual historical nations and content for release, but long term, maybe. Uh, so this is quite interesting. Now, the question in particular says ne not necessarily EU4 like. I actually thought to myself that if they did this in the EU4 custom nation creator, you know, style, but for Victoria 3, I, I thought it would be quite interesting because we are looking, of course, with the EU4 one at something where you define a primary culture, maybe a government form, right, uh, a primary religion, and so on and so forth, and that can then simply be applied on the actual pops that are within your state. For example, you know, hey, if you are in southern France, then you could just have Occitania, create that state, make uh, as accepted cultures. I don't know where we are splitting there, right? Is it Occitan or do they only have French? Either way, that is something that I would like to see, even if it is very much like the EU4 nation creator but it very much shouldn't be a priority i will tell you though i have plenty of ideas where i would make some fun nations at the end of the day of course having individually new nations is always better if you do it in a fully all encompassing mod but if you don't have the time to do that hey as long as the pops react to your new state in a logical manner you know if they share the primary culture then they won't care that you are a new state all of a sudden i think you could implement that it would be pretty cool either way Will there be special nations and tags just for imported long play games like Byzantines and the Aztecs? We're not intending to create special nations and tags for all of the possible conversion carryovers because it could be so many. That being said, we have added a few easter eggs here and there, so we do already know, I believe, that if you enable the game rule, so they are managing this via the game rule system, if you enable the game rule for basically wacky nations, right, you can recreate things such as the East Roman Empire, maybe even the Roman Empire itself, maybe the Holy Roman Empire, uh, whatever else there is. I, I'm, you know, thinking about about it. I mean, there are so many options. You could even go with uh, England. If you conquer it as the Danish, you could form the Dane law, the North Sea Empire, that sort of stuff, right? So some quasi-ridiculous stuff. Not all of it is all that ridiculous. I think the East Roman Empire is actually a very delicate topic since uh, that isn't as far removed as people think it to be. But what is more important here and where this question comes from is what if I want to convert a game from EU4 to Victoria 3? And what needs to be considered there, in my opinion, is that uh, maybe you weren't there or maybe ma some people weren't there when this actually happened, when Paradox tried to dip their toes into this, but I would promise you with a, a gun to my head, listen, I, I will stand by this opinion, I will tell you right now that we will never ever see another game converter again from them. They tried it between CK2 and EU4, they did an official one, it was a DLC back at the time, and once you have a converter that transports from game A to game B, right? And once you calculate that in, you need to consider not just what game A is doing in its updates, but also what game B is doing in its updates. If you bring in nations that could be carryovers from your CK3, from your Imperator Rome, all the way to Victoria 3 run, right? That is way too much debt. You need to take so many things into consideration. I don't think they want to do that. I don't think we're ever going to be seeing that again because it seemed to be a huge pain for them. So if anything, hey, you get some custom Easter egg nations, right? But uh, yeah, definitely never expect anything related to this uh, sort of long play carryover support. For that these days, uh, there are modding communities that do this. And I think, honestly, that's the best way where it should be because I, 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 listen, I'll be honest with you and this is just a very small tangent, I promise. But most people don't finish playing their games. Most people do not finish it. Most of the games are not designed to finish it. EU4 at the end of it is just mega blob fest, basically. There's nothing else going on. There's a few gigantic blobs. It's not a well-balanced world. You know how it should be. And with that in mind, I don't think a converter from the company is worth it. If you really want to go through it with a mega campaign, there will also be a lot of fine-tuning there. I think actually the... Uh, some of the devs, I think Groogie, uh, you know, may God bless him, uh, Groogie did a mega campaign with other devs and they did so much fine tuning in the numbers that they changed. Yeah, basically never expect this sort of stuff. They will not do it again. I promise you this just out of experience here. Will we see models of trains move around the railways on the map? Will they go choo-choo if we zoom in close enough? The latter question is very important to me. The trains do indeed travel around on the map and go choo-choo. In fact, the trains even go chugga-chugga. Uh, so, obviously, a bit of a meme question, but I like this one. 
because what they are considering here very much is the visual representation of your infrastructure. So far, and maybe this is still coming, I very much personally hope so, there is, and it, it, this is wild even to me as somebody that was in favor or is in favor of the new warfare uh, concept, but so far we haven't seen anything other than devastation of, you know, for example, soldiers being depicted, trenches being depicted, and so on. And that does make a worry, right? We have seen trains, we have seen carriages in previous screenshots, I, I think in previous footage as well, but we haven't seen much about it, we haven't heard much about it, I hope that we will learn a bit more about that. So this question is relevant to me as in so far as they clearly realize that you need a visual representation to make it all feel tangible. I hope that the philosophy that they have for trains where they go choo-choo and chugga-chugga uh, also plays a big role of course for how they do warfare, for how they do naval battles, naval engagements, that sort of thing, right? I want visual representation, it plays a big role in my uh, honest opinion. Any interesting new modding capability compared to CK3 planned that you can share. A major addition is the ability to mod AI strategies that govern all sorts of AI behavior, like which specific land it wants to conquer, if any, which goods and buildings it wants to focus on, which politics it favors, and so on. There'll be a dev diary on this at a later point. This comes directly from Wiz. I really love this. So, having followed the CK3 modding community for a while now and uh, hearing both the positive sides, most of the modding that you can do in CK3 is so much simpler compared to any game that came before it. Then there's some other stuff like UI widgets, not that that needs to mean anything to you, uh, but there are also aspects of course where modders say we would like to have this changed and the CK3 team is listening to be fair you know uh, much of what we what I just uh, mentioned and much of what I'm not mentioned because it's just too much and even I understand only half of it will be in 1.5 so with a royal quote that has already been confirmed by the developers for CK3 and yet of course there's always something that can be done and this sort of AI strategy that can be done in hopefully a very very grand way where we have a lot of factors a lot of potential choices that the AI can make what they should focus on what sort of resources what sort of land etc etc uh, I think this can be really, really useful, not just for mods that use the world map as something where then they place their, you know, I don't know, point of divergence and then there's a different uh, general border situation, but also and especially for people that are doing mods that are set in different maps. So if you take, for example, Anbana, if you take, for example, uh, whatchamacallit, Sunless Sea, if, if you take anything that is set not on Classic Earth, that doesn't have the same resources, that doesn't have the same uh, pop makeup and so on, then I think that we're looking at a situation where having an AI strategy that you can set as a modder is huge. This is a change that is really, really beneficial, I think, to the product that we will see developing before our very, very eyes once it releases, because the modding community is a quintessential part of, you know, uh, Paradox Games, of course, so them giving the tools to the modders here to allow for the actual selection of AI strategies is something that I very much welcome. How will the blimp reward from signing up to the newsletter be implemented in-game? Airships are one of the many things in the game that make the map more alive. The one you get for signing up for the newsletter will be making an appearance in place of the standard model from time to time. So basically just a variation. I do really wonder what blimps in general will be used for. Uh, you know, what are they represented for? Maybe they're represented for actual military campaigns. That was, of course, something in consideration. But there is, of course, this big aspect uh, as well when it comes to the civilian use of it. I mean in this time frame, or at the end of this time frame, I should say, the Hindenburg plays a significant role there as well. Um, I am really hoping that the map, not just with the trains, not just with the soldiers, but also with blimps, maybe with some cars, that sort of stuff, will come alive. In my opinion, one of the big things, uh, frankly, maybe even some pops sometimes, like even if it's just a tiny thing, if, if, a, if a city is rioting, you know, maybe we could see some people with signs similar to Anno 1800, but I think I'm dreaming too big there, I don't think that is happening. Either way, the blimp will basically be for the purpose of just eye candy. Are there historical event chains in-game to portray certain historical events that can't be shown by organic mechanics? We'll be talking about the vision for content in a future dev diary, but very broadly, I can say that content should emerge when the historical conditions make sense. Some of that will be country-specific. We will see something related to this it, uh, at a later uh, in a later question, but this is interesting with what we know about journals as well, you know. Obviously, they have talked about this dynamic content delivery system for quite some time. What exactly that means is, uh, you know, hey, my guess is as good as yours, I think, but what it should mean or what it might mean from what they have uh, at least told us so far is that basically, even if you're not the right country, if you have the right conditions for, for example, uh, communism, then that will spawn in your country. That will occur in your country because it makes sense right there. Karl Marx may still alive, uh, it may, may still be alive. He may already be dead. He may not even be born. Actually, I think he, he's like born during the entire section of this game now that I think about it. Right. But where I'm coming from is that he doesn't need to be the central figure, but if it applies, at least the way it seems to me, then he may very well get his uh, feature event, basically. 
I am very curious about content delivery. We have seen the journal system a bit, but nothing in detail. I said back then when we looked at journals in particular, I think that was uh, when it came to the new screenshots, I said that I really hope that Victoria 3 will be working more with basically generated missions, similar to how uh, uh, Imperator Rome was trying to do it, but less, even less tight than that. Basically just something that happens whenever the occurrence is, you know, available in a state, be it urbanizing a state, be it industrializing a state, that sort of stuff, be it starting a war against somebody else. Um, if they work more with missions and with actual, basically, you could call it a quest, but I would call it more like a, just a, a storyline, right, that unfolds as you, for example, legalize opium, that sort of stuff. If they work primarily with that, I would be insanely happy, and I hope that this will also then, you know, if the opportunity arrives, that this will also allow for historical events to happen as they did. Here's a neat one. Is colorblindness considered in the design of the UI? Yes, I can say we've been working towards addressing some colorblindness issues with our game particularly because it is more number heavy than any other. We've been working on a dynamic setting that should allow for us to expand its coverage and hopefully, don't confirm quote me here, allow for modding as well to help cover all the various possibilities. Maybe we can do a dev diary on it in the future. This is a really neat one. Um, I think that I can't count how many complaints about, uh, you know, issues for colorblind people I have seen be it on Reddit, be it in the, in, in the forums, be it on my channel, I, I've seen a number of those, a large number of those. So I'm very happy to see that they are, of course, taken care for that. The more accessible the UI of the game is, the better it is because, and I've said this uh, ages ago, I think, I, I don't think we've talked about this in a while, but there's a difference in my eyes, uh, you know, between complexity, genuine complexity, and complexity just because it's inaccessible. Many of the older games that we have, including Victoria 2, very much including Victoria 2, are primarily not accessible. The UI is making it hard for you to read, not to mention, of course, if you're colorblind, for example, that makes it significantly worse. Uh, now with this, you know, with Victoria 3, where it's so important to know whether a number, for example, is green, whether it is red, whether there are any other shades involved there, whether a light or a dark green means a difference, right? That sort of stuff. They should be very considerate about this, and I'm happy to see that they're doing it so that then the UI makes the game accessible and the true complexity of Victoria 3 can basically be judged. Will we be able to zoom out fully and see the whole world? Yes, and we put a keyboard shortcut in for you to instantly zoom out and then you can click the map plus release the shortcut to instantly zoom in there. I love that. No longer will I have to scroll endlessly. A uh, big fan of this. I think this is a, just a pretty basic convenience, but it's one of those conveniences that I don't think we've ever really had, uh, and it's the first convenience where I'm personally saying they they took away the minimap, you know, for example, in Hoi 4, and I said, hey, I, I kind of work with the minimap a lot, and I may no longer do that. Getting the all general overview right and then being able to zoom in, that is a big step, that is a big positive step, so big fan of this small, convenient tidbit. Can states be renamed, or will there be decisions to change state names to their historical ones once they've been conquered by another country? So I think... Uh, what mostly would apply here is, for example, Alsace-Lorraine and then Elsass-Lothringen if Germany were to conquer it, right? As answered previously, we're not going to have player named entities at release, but hopefully post-release. However, states are dynamically named based on various factors and can even have very specific names under certain circumstances. So no more British British Columbia, right? <laughs> that one is a good one. Uh, the fact that they're actually accounting for that. I will, I'm very curious for how... Uh, you know, dynamic it is. The fact that you can't rename anything for launch, yes, it's not a priority, but I do think that there's a lot of roleplay potential in that. There's a lot of uh, just micro-focus on that, basically, where you just say, yeah, okay, I renamed the city in the glory of the Kaiser, and that is part of how you play the game. Uh, similar to how, for example, you know, you currently can't, I still think it's, it's the case currently, right? But you can't rename your grandchildren if they are born at your court in CK3, whereas you could do it in CK2. Maybe it already changed for CK3, but I know that at least at launch it wasn't the case. I think this is something that I would be very happy about. Long term, of course, we are also looking at a situation where the more flexible the renaming system is to begin with, and they say that they already have a dynamically renaming system in place, right? But the more flexible it is, the easier it will be to have far-reaching systems underneath it. What I mean, for example, is in CK3 you have uh, the community title project, the community names project. Honestly, they changed the name. Hey, don't sue me for not <laughs> remembering the name anymore. No, I, I love them. Gib is uh, the project leader, if I'm not mistaken. And they do great work in the sense that if you as a culture conquer territory that there is a name for this territory for, it will automatically rename. So there is a lot of micro in there, uh, or rather it, it 
takes away a lot of micro that you would manually have to do and lets you roleplay quite significantly. The more flexible the Victoria 3 system is, the more can a mod like this one also be applied there where then, you know, hey, I don't know, maybe every single state in Africa has, for example, terms for German, terms for English, for French, for Chinese and so on and so forth, right? Making it so that it's actually quite interesting to conquer something and then see, hey, yeah, this is my possession now. This actually changed the name. It isn't just, it wasn't just named, you know, the British conquer, I don't know, German Southwest Africa and then it's called British German Southwest West Africa. Let's hope that that is indeed no longer happening. Can you list some formable nations? This one is an interesting one, although the answer is a bit of a meme. Sure, there's Italy and Germany and Ethiopia. That's a cool one. And Yugoslavia. That's also a cool one. Uh, obviously, this is a bit of a meme question. Um, the implication here appears to be that Ofelov has been uh, posed here that there are basically a, a boatload of formal, formables and they don't want to talk about it right now. They want to, you know, save that maybe for a dev diary, maybe just for, I don't know, an update video or something like that. And I find that interesting. We talked about this in a different video as well, that since your rank of a country can increase and that gives you more prestige, you need to have a lot of possibilities in a lot of places, right? Let's think, for example, about Krakow. Krakow is a city-state. If you became, I don't know, uh, upper Poland, right? So the duchy tier, if, if you want to call it that, the region tier. If you became that, that should be a higher level. If you became the kingdom of Poland, that should be even higher. And then if you, I don't know, became the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, for example, that should put you in a position of actually being, you know, an empire. And that is interesting to me. Technically, it's a king. I know, listen, don't worry about it, okay? But that is interesting to me because you would need such a ladder, such a rising up progression in basically all locations. Maybe France can just declare itself an empire. Maybe uh, we're looking at a different situation, you know, where certain areas just don't have it. Is Iberia just the empire title for Iberia? Can I, as a colonial overlord, name myself emperor in my colony if I have an entire region? There is, th There are a lot of questions, in my opinion, when it comes to formable nations, since they aren't just, okay, here's a reward for you expanding. Rather, they actually have a gameplay impact in the form of giving you prestige. Again... Sadly, not too much here, but we know Yugoslavia exists. That means Serbia can form Yugoslavia, and maybe you can form, like, let's say the Balkans. Maybe the Serbian Empire. That was a thing that, that they did, you know, for a while. The Bulgarian Empire, maybe. Um, yeah, I have no idea how the, how the progress there works, but that is something to keep an eye on. So take this question and answer as a reminder. How much exactly is the role of characters in Victoria 3? For example, characters like Bismarck, who were crucial to their nations and also the whole world's fate during this era, how would people like him with their ups and downs in their careers be represented? I would contest that great man theory interpretation of history. It's not all about the bald man with a pointy helmet. Characters can agitate for things, but it's the force of whole groups of people with a common interest. Interest groups. That gives the real push for change and domestic politics and foreign affairs. So, first of all, I completely agree with Ofelov. Uh, second of all, I have seen different approaches. I know people that basically say, why are characters in Victoria 3 in the first place? That really sucks. I don't, I don't care for characters. This is the radical opposition, if you will. This is the, the point of view where it's like characters should be a huge thing that matters, maybe bigger than interest groups, right? Uh, obviously, I don't think that the great man theory makes any sense in this aspect because the people that are rising up, the people that are leading the interest groups, the people that are Bismarck, for example, they are shaped by their environments and they are enabled or disabled uh, by their environments as well. So having them intertwined, you know, un you can't separate them, basically, with the interest groups, in my opinion, makes a lot of sense. They can have their own opinions, they can have their own sort of stamp, you know, that is the trait of the leader that goes into the interest group, as long as the leader is the leader. Um, but the interest group itself goes deeper, the interest group itself is made up of thousands, possibly millions of members, and they have interests that won't just change entirely just because there's a new leader. Bismarck didn't come and then convinced everybody of a completely different vision. No, he just had a very specific form of a vision that already existed in particular, of course, with the Juncker and with the uh, old, uh, you know, royals within Prussia itself, where he basically uh, said, OK, what I see myself as is the pres uh, preserver of Prussian power, of the king's power, and I serve the king. There were a lot of loyalists there, there were a lot of anti-democratic, anti-parliament factions in there, but he didn't pick up anything completely new. What his opinions were was already definitely covered by the main interest groups there as well. Nonetheless, I do also want to approach the people that basically say I didn't ask for characters. I, You know, we had generals and whatnot, of course, as characters in Victoria 2 as well. Technically also the uh, actual, uh, I mean, characters in Victoria 2 outside of the generals meant barely anything, but people that are out there and say, why are you putting these characters in? This should be all about pops. I don't think that these characters here are just planted. 
the way they are implemented, the way we know about them, isn't just on top of, for example, the, the pops to then make the powers of the pops less meaningful. I don't think that is the case at all. The way it seems to me is basically that there should always be a bit of a of an alteration. If you play Prussia, the leader today in this playthrough of, for example, the landed gentry should possibly have a slightly different agenda than the leader of the landed gentry, you know, tomorrow. That is the main role that they fulfill. Obviously, we have learned that assassinations, that uh, exile, that sort of stuff, it does exist. And that also basically just makes it so that your population can then react to this move against a person. The characters themselves, of course, yes, they can give clout. They, if they're generals, they can give immense number of clouds, right? But the, ma the, the major topic here is that I don't think we have reason to be concerned that Paradox is falling into the great man theory and with that is abandoning the focus on Pops. I don't think that is adequate. Instead, I think that they're primarily acting as catalysts for where Pops are going, where their ideologies are going, where their IGs are going, and how the cloud is standing. And I think that is a good device. I think that makes a lot of sense. So, uh, yeah, I'm in the middle of this. For once, I'm a, I'm a moderate, right? I'm a fan of them having characters the way that they do. I can see people, of course, that are worried that they take away too much attention. Let me know whether you think about that. That is an opinion that I would love to see, because I have only uh, met that opinion, basically, in my personal uh, circle of friends, right? Uh, but then there are also people that say, hey, characters should play an even bigger role, which I also disagree with. I'm uh, firmly in the center. Let me know what you think. I think this is quite the contentious one. What are you most excited for in terms of new modding capabilities? I've seen some absolutely next level overhauls just focused on replacing buildings, production methods and goods made by members of the team on their free project time. Uh, I actually know that, I, I believe it was Overloaf that coded in game developers into London, 100,000 of them and they were all starving. Uh, was an interesting, you know, example of modding, I guess. And I think this is where we will see the most amount of modding. Having said that, we aim to make nearly everything we put in the game moddable, so undoubtedly we will see new laws, institutions, tech trees, diplomatic actions, subject types, military behaviors, and even AI mods. There's also another major feature we use to support the event system, which we'll cover in a dev diary in January, that I'm also positive we'll see some really amazing mods written for it. Yeah, the event system, again, I'm really curious, but in general, um, I like how moddable the production method in general are. This is a, there's a huge tangent here that I'm not going to go into, not to that degree anyway, but in Victoria 2 you had an ideal state of pop distribution, of pop makeup, because factories desired exactly very specific, uh, uh, you know, 80-20s, the 80-20 rule between craftsmen and clerks. That is what you need in your pops that work in factories, period. There's no other debate, there's no other efficiency, this is the way it needs to be. In Victoria 3, in the base game, because of how production methods work, where with the first production method you primarily might need laborers, then afterwards you might need engineers, but that will shift depending on your actual production method setup. This will fundamentally change the setup of every single nation in the game, whereas in Victoria 2 everybody was quite similar because factories wherever you were demanded for the same ratio of people. In Victoria 3 this will change significantly, and this can change even further, uh, of course, in mods, something that I also have on the radar, I'm not sure whether it's going to be good gameplay wise, but I would love to test it since the devs are not implementing it this way. But what you can definitely do with this is you have barracks, those barracks uh, have production methods and right now if you advance in the quality of rifles, if you advance in the quality of ammunition, you are looking at fundamentally just an increase in quantity. So for example, production method A is uh, one unit of ammunition, production method B is two units of ammunition, and you get better stats of attack and defense, for example. You could, and I'm sure we will see this, and I would love to test this, whether it's fun, whether it's good, I don't know, but I would like to see it so that we can, you know, test it fundamentally. Um, you could mod in something where the barracks have production methods, much like we had it just now, they increase the stats of your actual uh, companies, but instead of ammunition, you know, just one unit and then two units, it's like ammunition A, so I don't know what sort of ammunition for example, but then the second one would be ammunition B, or flint locked rifles, or you know, machine guns, and those actually require different gun goods, right? That is something that currently or won't be in vanilla because uh, it has been deemed to be very cumbersome and I can see it there are some doubts that I have because I think trade would be completely annoying very very annoying you need to trade for very specific items basically um I would like to see this in action I would like to see how it goes whether you can make this work and excitingly much like Mikael Anderson says right here you can make this work in modding so yeah very excited to see how that pans out once they actually get their hands on the game to show us a mod like this and see whether it is fun or whether it isn't fun
Are there any alt history formables? We certainly have some and we like to add more before release. Scandinavia and Grand Columbia are some examples. Just so you know, those two are now definitely confirmed. I think Scandinavia was never uh, in question. This, this, hey, this is a Swedish game company. Sweden is going to be insanely overpowered and Scandinavia, I'm sure when you form it, gives you 1000 prestige. What are some of the biggest quality of life changes that are planned or that have been made? There is a lot, but just to take one example, we've implemented prediction functions when you change a prediction method or expand a building for how profitable the method building will be. So it basically will tell you this is what it will look like if you change to this production method, you will make more money, you will have more expenses and in the end you come out better or worse. This in itself isn't new, but what is new about it is that the prediction takes into account factors such as how prices are going to change, not just from that particular building method, but also from every other building currently in your construction queue. Pop goods substitution, so you can see if there's potential for a good to be consumed, even if it's not currently consumed. Oh my god, this is so beautiful to read, and so on. These predictions are actually also used by the AI to be able to far more accurately plan out its economic decisions than in our other games. This is, this is such a powerful tool. You can actually tell where in the future a price will very likely be. Again, this doesn't necessarily account for what other states are doing, how your market is behaving, what other states in your market are doing outside of your market, whether they're exporting, importing, but it takes a lot into account that is at least going on on your end of things. And that is definitely something that will help the AI, you know, to uh, calculate what they're doing, but to also help you. I'll be honest with you, if this wasn't in, I do think there would be big issues for many players to recognize when to build something, when to upgrade something, and to fully understand when it will actually help your population, your household, and so on. So this is a really big step towards actually giving you a really easy tool to understand what to do and then make the right decisions. Again, like I said, there's a difference between complexity because it's inaccessible and true complexity, I think. Here we have the better, the latter part. Hello devs, thanks for this Q&A. Victoria 3 has different economic systems and laws that make countries more varied than Victoria 2. During your playtests, have you seen the same nation, for example the United States of America, play out in a very different way. Could you give an example perhaps? Thanks. Uh, I've seen theocratic United States of America. Um, I like the idea that depending on what you... And, and this is so ob obvious. This is so self-evident. I So me saying it, you, you need to give me a second, but I like the idea of you playing something differently or the world developing differently actually leading to huge butterfly effect-like changes. You can say that this could theoretically happen in Victoria 2, but Victoria 2 and its mods, HPM, HFM, are much more railroad. I think GFM is like the newest one. Listen, I I, I think GFM is a good one, but I, I can't remember. Either way, uh, the way I see it in this, in this, uh, you know, in this area is that the more sensible changes are possible, the better it is. Should they always become theocratic? Does it make sense? I don't think so at all. But under the right circumstances, I think it would be incredibly cool to see these big changes and yeah indeed the United States can become theocratic and if they can and who says Prussia can't I'm gonna have the Prussian Pope on the throne can we expect more pie charts and graphs in the release state of the game a question this is a truly massive question we'll have more charts and graphs than you can st uh, shake a stick at we recently rewrote our trends backend system to be able to support a ridiculous amount of data sampling just so that we can give you more charts thank you Thank you very much. Th this is great. Uh, I hope I can choose between the form of it and I will exclusively be using pie charts, not because they're good at information <laughs> at information uh, trans transmission, but rather because I like them. What are your current plans for achievements? Achievements for release are actually already planned out. We've tried to focus on having a bunch of different challenges, not just Conquer X, though there's certainly achievements like that too. We'll of course keep adding achievements after release as well. Yeah, uh, Honestly, the achievement culture is all over the place in Paradox Games. Seagate 3 is super easy achievements, most of them. And when I say super easy, what I mean is they come up in natural play. You need to play, you need to be good at it, sure, but you don't need to do something incredibly, like, uh, weird and difficult. There, there is one, uh, King of All the Isles, which is literally all the Isles. You can't go over, I think, 80 realm size, and you need to restrict yourself in that way to all of the Isles that are, for example, you know, near the British Isles, in the Baltic Sea, in the Mediterranean, and uh, yeah, that's it, basically, right? That is a lot of work, and that is a really cool achievement, but most of the achievements for CK3 are much more just play, just have fun. Play in Iron Man, and you will get achievements. EO4, super tryhardy. Uh, Hearts of Iron 4, oh my god, so tryhardy. Good god, just puns and they're all tryhardy. <laughs> CK2, a lot of tryhardy stuff as well. I tell you that as somebody that has 100% at CK2, but like, oh my god, so much tryhardy stuff. I had to play to the end day three times from 867, 769, and 1066 so that I could get all, all three of those achievements. Uh, I hope that 
Victoria 3 finds a middle ground between maybe CK3 and uh, let's say Hoi 4. You know, somewhere in between. Something that is fun but doesn't make you scratch your head at why the devs want you to waste your time. That would be neat. Do each government type get a unique flag? Will, will, uh, will we see the glorious Magnovishnir flag in Victoria 3? Keep an eye on upcoming dev diaries this week, on this Thursday. So just in two days, we will learn everything about flags. Keep that in mind. Which types of countries tend to be the most beginner-friendly or hostile? Personally, I think Japan is very beginner-friendly, but to a great extent, how difficult a country is largely depends on what your goals are. Yeah, you can probably like survive as any given country, but whether you are on the top of your game and uh, on the top of the world, right? That is a different question. But Japan very much sounds like a beginner-friendly nation because Japan is so isolated. At most, Commodore Perry comes knocking and says, open your market, and then you say, okay, and then you reform, and then you just start blobbing, you know, Korea, of course, Manchuria, maybe other parts of China if you get lucky enough. Maybe the Philippines, maybe we are also looking at uh, Indonesia, right? Uh, Malaya, uh, that sort of stuff. And... Basically, nobody threatens you. There's nobody that goes, I want your home country. If you are Bavaria, if you're Prussia, people want your homelands. Uh, so in that sense, I definitely think Japan is one of the easier countries. It will also be my go-to country to learn about unrecognized gameplay because Japan is obviously expected to become recognized as the game proceeds. Meaning that you are meant to get it done. So I assume that it should be fairly beginner-friendly to actually get it done. I will definitely do that as my first unrecognized game Whenever the game becomes available. Will becoming a formable nation be an immediate button click or will it have to go through a process like laws do? As long as you meet the preconditions, it's just a button click to declare yourself a new nation. The key is meet the preconditions. This is the stuff that very likely will take a lot of time to do. I assume this is very similar to, uh, for example, Victoria 2 decisions, right? You click something, you get an event, and then it has occurred. Maybe like CK3, form a new kingdom, form a new empire, make a new title. I think that is what we can expect in terms of involvement once you are able to actually create it. I don't think that I would even be in favor of a process of actually needing to pass a law. I I just don't think I have to ask my parliament. Like, obviously, yes, you could theoretically have to, and there were circumstances as well. Uh, I, I believe, wasn't it the British parliament that actually called out uh, the empire in India for Victoria? Either way, though, I do think that this is just one of those things... I think it would be cumbersome and kind of boring. Uh, if you want to proclaim Scandinavia or Germany, then hey, you're going to go ahead and do that, right? You worked for it. You, you achieved this steady government that is in the position of actually getting a formable nation because you were involved with the political process. So I don't think I would personally like it if they actually changed that. How will you integrate real historical flavor, decisions, events, music, artwork, and options for alternate historical events slash timelines? This is one that I referred to earlier. We have an event about Karl Marx writing the Communist Manifesto, but maybe Marx is a child or dead by this point, or maybe socialism first emerged in Borneo, in which case someone else will write the Communist Manifesto. That's what I was talking about when I said that I hope that I think that, you know, this always connects nicely to potential historical events, but otherwise gives you an alt history event integrated into this, right? It's the dynamic content delivery system. Not sure what exactly that means, but it sounds good, right? Doesn't it? Will natural disasters and man-made disasters be a thing in the game? Will we also have animated events instead of just paintings? Animated events, I guess they might be referring here to something similar to CK3, right? Where in CK3 the characters are standing around and the royal court is going to make it so that you actually have everybody in a 3D environment to begin with. Um, that's interesting though. I, I could see this if like, for example, one of your leaders gets assassinated, that your leader is right there, right? That That's his last existence basically. Other than that, I mean, yeah, new environments for events is always something that I'm looking forward to. I think CK3 is doing a huge step there. I am curious about what Victoria 3 is doing, but let's read the answer. I am struggling to think of any event that are in some way a disaster for one pop or another. There are lots of disasters, natural and otherwise. As for the event system overall, we will discuss this in uh, more in an upcoming dev diary, so no further details on that right now. I wonder how much natural disaster, so for example a volcano exploding, an earthquake, a tsunami, how much that will play a role because it could theoretically either be completely something that you just anticipate because you know this will happen at a certain year because it's historical, right? Or it will become random to a degree where you could get frustrated. This is, th this is a difficult line to walk. I'm very interested in how they're going to take all of this, but yeah, I mean, honestly, after tech came out, I was like, the next system that I want to explain is everything around events, journals, and so on. So I'm praying that we're going to see that soon. I, I think January, right? So yeah, there you go.
And this actually brings us to the end of this video. As you can see, there were a lot of small tidbits, but a lot of stuff that, you know, were open questions that nobody had an answer to until the Q&A. So I thought it was important to bring that up. Now, uh, do let me know what you think about the uh, questions respectively. There was, of course, one central question where I asked, you know, hey, let me know what you think about the great man theory, about the impact that you know, characters could have, whether you like it, whether you dislike it. That is the thing that I'm the most interested in out of all the answers in this video. And for the moment, I will see you later, alligator.